Thank you so much, sir. Um, uh, thank you so much, Derek and Cynthia and uh, Teddy, Ali, Libby, uh, everyone on the lab team for making this all possible for all of us, all the artists and audiences who've been coming and filled us all so much over the past few days. So um, I, I imagine you two are just breathing with the beautiful performance we saw. So thank you so much, Miranda and Robert, who are here representing Lub Dub. And Shannon, wow. yes, yes. That was uh, such a comprehensive journey that we were taken on. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I took a lot, I've taken a lot from the last few days, as I'm sure you have too. And uh, so I'm just going to slip back for two seconds to, uh, or a couple minutes, uh, to honoring the past and shaping the future the panel I attended. And people were bringing people into the room. So I have a couple people I would like to bring. And uh, the first person I'd like to bring is Gavin Schmidt, who is a NASA scientist, who's been one of the scientists like Bill McKibben, who's been calling our attention to the climate story uh, for many years. And Theater Without Borders had a climate change theater action in 2015. These are, if those of you don't know about them, they're, um, every two years with the conversation of the partners, uh, COP21 took place in Paris. That was the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, uh, we do an event with the Arctic Cycle, Chantal Bilodeau, uh, and it began with new pa uh, No Passport, Kari Dudsvich. We do a kind of a simultaneous event where playwrights around the world are invited to write something about climate, relates to climate short pieces, their prompts, um, one minute, five minutes, uh, and they're performed simultaneously around the world in living rooms, on glaciers, at universities, um, we do something at the same time. Uh, this year is the third incarnation in 2019, and uh, you're all welcome to participate. Ask, ask afterwards if you want to know more. Um, so in 2015, we, ha we had an event at the New York Poets Theater in um, New York, and Gavin Schmidt was our honored guest, and he stood up in front of the group before the readings by the, by the playwrights, and um, he said, well, I could talk to you for hours about the science, but I really only want to take five minutes of your time. You are the artists, and we need you. We need you to tell the story of what is happening for this generation and for all the generations to come. And he sat down. <laughs> and, um, Miranda, Robert, and Lobdub, you have told a story for this generation and for all the generations to come. And thank you for doing that. And I know that the other artists on this panel and many of you in the audience are doing the same. And uh, the other person I wanted to bring um, into the room was, if I can find it on my little computer. <laughs> my teeny tiny invaluable computer. Um, I saw a movie, I was talking to Alex Aaron, um, I saw the movie uh, Knock Down the House with my husband Mitch. And uh, someone said, the fierce urgency of now, a quote by Martin Luther King. And I was like, what's that from, what's that from? The fir fierce urgency of now, that sounds like climate. <laughs> um, so I, um, I researched it and here's, Martin Luther King. In April 1967, a year before he was killed, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. preached on the fierce urgency of now in a sermon entitled, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. 
Of all his speeches, it remains the least remembered because it summoned Christians to protest the war in Vietnam. And I quote, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still a thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and pushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. We must move past indecision to action. So I think um, all of us who are grappling, and that's all of us, as your beautiful piece showed, all of us who are grappling with this have an opportunity, and that is to engage with our grief and with our hope. And um, we have some incredible uh, leaders here in, in guiding us in, in how to move forward in that. So I wanted to start with um, Miranda and, uh, and Robert. You have one, take two mics. And um, we were just talking a little bit over lunch um, about the history of this project and um, the, the th levels of grief that are mentioned in the piece and, and how grief and hope oper for, operate for you in the piece. So if you could just speak about that a little bit. Um, I don't know quite what to say. Um, I think that uh, a lot of times as an artist, I try to scan my body for where I feel fear and sadness and um, try to start from some of those places. And some of the most intense dread and terror and sadness that I have been feeling um, connect to a lot of the research that I've been doing into climate crisis and extinction. And I felt in myself that my own um, fear and sadness was limiting me and creating a profound barrier in my ability to engage with the material. And I said a little prayer <laughs> that maybe uh, through the process of um, investigating this work through my theatrical and um, literary imagination, I might have the ability to metabolize some of that fear and um, sadness and loosen it up a little bit, uh, the kind of barriers to the emotional potency of, of these issues so that I could, uh, so that they could become more malleable. Um, and that's what I've been trying to do. And, and this piece kind of started for context um, with Lub Dub, which comprises Miranda and myself and Caitlin and Jeff and a, another on, ensemble of folks. Um, and we had committed to starting a two-year cycle of work interested in the environment. And at the time that we were committing to, to that process, um, I, I feel comfortable sharing that, that my mother was starting hospice at the time. And um, I was like, you know, many, many things that Miranda has written in the play express my practice of dramaturgy a lot better than I can in a post-show <laughs> environment, which is a real gift. Um, but I was like voraciously reading about climate crisis. And, you know, at, at, at one point at a, at a trip to where my mom was living at the time, you know, I was like, I'm kind of using this research as some kind of shield from my personal experience of what's happening in my own life. And so, through many, many conversations, we became really interested in this idea of holding up a particular story of individual level grief about one particular homo sapiens next to this idea of species loss and um, just asking a question of, 
you know, in what ways are the emotional responses to those separate elements different? In, in what ways are they similar? And in what ways might that energy be productive? You know, um, the Lub Dub um, it defines itself on, the, on your website as a hybrid physical theater company animating stories of science, magic, and myth. And when you look at the little video, um, it's just these delightful young people. <laughs> and they're saying, what is Lub Dub? It's joyful exploration, it's humor, wonder, jumping, dancing, something that tickles us, something we love. And um, I thought uh, it's such a beautiful um, juxtaposition that you were able to find in the piece between um, the participatory nature, the, the humor, and the joy. So how does hope figure in uh, <laughs> and you were talking a little bit about joy, uh, Miranda. Um. <laughs> uh, I think joy is a practice, and um, it's something you have to set about intentionally. I think happiness is conditional, and joy is a practice. And I think that's something that we try to practice in our company. And... Um, I think that I've done a lot of um, trauma work and studying about trauma work, and there's this um, <laughs> great wisdom of gallows humor. And I think that if you don't have it, you die. And um, <laughs> so I needed to find it. <laughs> and I think that that is... Uh, I think that the beauty of imagination is uh, its buoyancy. And I think that's what we can add to a paralyzing uh, matter. So I, maybe I'll just add that I think we spend a lot of time in conversations around this piece, which are ongoing, uh, thinking about different types of care. Um, and we were thinking a lot about the idea of hospice as a, as a type of care which kind of admits mortality and um, often often the beginning of a hospice process as I'm sure so many people in this room know it can actually be kind of relieving and kind of wonderful in this really intense and kind of strange way but but we were in interested in types of hope that integrated grief rather than types of hope that um, attempt to mask it or block it off or undermine it yeah. I mean, well, uh, everybody, I, I, people bring different amounts of information to, to, to the room here, I'm sure, and I'm a latecomer to the climate uh, science myself. I, I identified with the character um, <laughs> in the play that my science knowledge is limited. Um, uh, and many of you here have more science knowledge, many of you in the audience do, um, and many of the practitioners who are working at this intersection do. But there are, of course, many others in the world who are working very, very hard to ensure that we all will, some things will go forward. And so um, there's also on a practical level of hope. And that makes me want to turn to you, Annalisa. <laughs> because there's the individual experience, and we, we saw a play of an of a individual um, uh, speaking of her encounter with this story and struggle to, to, in a sense, reach out and connect with us, the audience. You are looking at that not only um, uh, in the works that you're doing, which I hope you'll speak about, but also in a systemic way uh, in terms of um, how we can actually all look at the world through a different lens that will help us ad advance. Can you speak about that? I'm having so many feelings right now. Thanks a lot, Miranda, <laughs> and loved up. <laughs> um, and I, actually, I was sitting in this, in the many feelings, and I'm trying to think about how to both be articulate about what is happening for me, because there's a sort of demand in this work to speak and like deal with what you're feeling with authenticity. Um, so I'm actually trying to process that and speak to what you're um, asking. Um, so bear with me, <laughs> please. Um, Thank you. Uh, I think one of the things that I'm feeling really strongly right now is actually um, anger and rage. Um, because we are not doomed to a dying world. We are not. Uh, and there are people who are, like, 
there are politicians and there are systems who are telling us that that is true um, and that we might as well give up and not do anything about it and that it's too late and it's not. <laughs> it's really not. Um, so I, th I think the wisdom out there from some of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and that's the largest body of scientists in the world, um, the most recent wisdom from them is that we have 12 years, but by the time, which is the time by which the entire world systems must change. It's, it's not actually impossible. It sounds impossible, but it's not. There are, there are policy proposals that are on, on the table that would make the changes that are needed. Um, it's really a question of the political will to make those um, proposals go through. Um, so some of the work that I'm involved in, specifically, specifically within the theater and art sector, um, right now there's a group of us that are working on uh, what we're calling a green new theater, um, which is which is actually recognizing um, the role that the arts, this very specific role that the arts can play in shifting the narrative. Um, one of the great things that we are gifted with in this field is storytelling and uh, emotional impact and um, sh getting people to shift the way that they're telling the story of what is happening in the world and what actions um, need to be taken. Um, so some of the work around Green New Theater will be working on at the TCG conference in Miami in June, and then um, there'll be ways for more folks to get involved in that and implement that in your organizations and in your practice um, after we sort of like workshop it in June. Um, so I... I, I wonder if you could also talk a little bit about um, your work with Just Transition Oh, and sure. unsettling America, because you, um, as, as you say, we need a we need we're transforming now. You're you're encouraging us to transform our practice and systems through in 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 all aspects. It's a holistic, yeah, notion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if y'all haven't heard of this concept of a just transition, um, very much encourage you to just like Google it. One of the best resources out there is Movement Generation. Um, they have a really nice graphic that explains uh, pretty holistically how to get from an extractive economy, which is what we're living in now, to a regenerative economy. And it's really vi visually well done. Like, I, I, they, you, they've done it. <laughs> you should really look at that. Um, it's movement generation, the just transition graphic. Um, but, like, because I'm a theater artist, why don't, and we just are doing some participatory theater, why don't we do a little bit of this right now? So, um, so I invite you from your seats to just, like, I do some Boal work, some image theater. So make an image in your body of the word, when you hear the word extraction, what does your body do? Like, make an image of that. Don't think too hard, just whatever comes into your body. Okay, great. Remember that image. Let it go. And now, if you can, think about the word regenerative and put that word in your body. Whatever it makes your body do, don't think too hard. Remember that image. Great. Now, can you try to connect the two of them and go from extractive to regenerative with just one movement? It doesn't need to be complicated. How would you do it? And just shout out words. What does that movement feel like? Opening? Tension. Releasing tension. Flow. Flow. Letting go. Letting go. What was Encompassing. Encompassing. Healing. 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 Giving. Rising. Rising. Right on. Right on. And these are all words that are, that are like implementable strategies to move us from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. So if you go and look at that graphic, it's a really great way to sort of like, it, it shows, it visualizes how, um, for example, like the health sector has to change and how education and how, like all of the different systems that are interlocking um, all contribute and all um, can shift together. Thank you. And, um, you know, keep, keep your eye out for the bioengineers, the guys who are and men and women who are taking um, uh, materials and finding ways to now cycle them.
through so that we're still using, but uh, we're reusing and reusing, and that includes tires and uh, and uh, so there's there there's work on the practical level, there's work on the mental level, the emotional level, lots lots of levels that we're working on. Thank you. Um, one of the um, I want to press through because I really do want to get to questions. I hope so. Um, one of the things that I always think about in this situation, and especially when I saw your uh, phantom limb video, Jessica, is how beauty makes the unbearable bearable. And I wonder if you want to speak a little bit about how you incorporate, uh, your, your, your images are indeed beautiful. And I'm hoping we'll see that video, but would you like to just take the mic and speak and show the video at your, your choice? Maybe we could show the video, let the images speak first, and then, thanks. Yeah, is that possible to, to share the video that Jessica brought us? Yes. And there, there is audio. I just want to give you a tiny bit of background information about um, what you're going to see. So on March 11th, 2011, there was a natural disaster turned man-made in Japan that the Japanese may never fully recover from. There was a catastrophic earthquake followed by a tsunami with up to 60-foot waves. And finally, a nuclear meltdown from a nuclear reactor that was providing energy to Tokyo and spread deadly toxic radiation across hundreds of miles. This land will not be safe for humans in any of our lifetimes. We're concluding a trilogy and we've been talking about this subject of people's relationship to nature or the environment for a decade. The first piece was based in ice, and then the second was the wood or the forest. And, you know, as we're heightening our awareness about environmental issues, water seems to be one of the paramount issues. And there's a new radiation crisis in Japan, in Fukushima. So we thought, what if we were to try and create a new artistic response to that in collaboration, because climate change is a global problem, and that, and that fallout is actually a global problem, and the of the ocean, and so we thought, what if we introduced Buto and puppetry? What would happen? I went all over northern Japan, really asking people about their experiences of both the loss of home and loss of people. It felt really important to speak to people who went through this and who are still going through it to this day. Natural disasters are going to happen more and more because of extreme weather, and these people are showing us a picture of the future of our planet. I set aside some time to work with Buto Master Dai Matsuoka, who is my collaborator in the piece in Buto choreography. And he just did these incredible things where you know, he was operating the puppet with his feet and sort of passively puppeting and ideas that never quite occurred to me. Buto, uh like they deal with the human body as material, also focuses on the theme of death. Uh, I think Buto and puppets have many similarities. As you know, as a puppet nerd, I think of the puppet as a as a as a blank canvas, often we say, or as, a, as an empty vessel that the, the viewer projects onto or into. And in terms of Buto, they refer to the body physically as a vessel. I realized I had been trying to create this new narrative or some really interesting drama and I kind of came to the conclusion that I could never come close to 
creating any kind of drama that is as powerful as what actually happened there. And so the story of the natural disaster itself is the fulcrum of the piece. And we move fluidly through all these relationships and try not actually to identify one character as much more important than the other because we wanted to communicate this sense that this loss is not the loss of one. This is all of ours. I think all of us think that the problem is so big that there's nothing that a single person can do to really make an impact and so we don't do anything. And what I kind of heard and what I learned from these people is that the accumulation of many people doing small things is what heals the world and that we all need to keep doing that. And in order to keep doing that, you need to have a little bit of hope and you need to have a little bit of optimism. That, that cat on the bicycle was in the exclusion zone in Fukushima. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful, yeah? <laughs> so I, f I feel like that took up a lot of time and you, and you understand a lot about what we're doing now from that. But, um, but to just speak to your question about beauty, um, we've, been, we've been working on a trilogy about people's relationship to nature and climate change for over 10 years. And the, when we made the first piece, it was like really not sexy to sell a show about climate change. And it still sort of isn't, but people now know that they should be engaging with that topic. <laughs> but back then it was, you know, I think just not, not as happening. So um, if you can call climate change happening. But um, so we are, my husband and I, who have the company together, are visual artists first and foremost. And um, we... Um, we always start with, ima with images and we work with kind of the theory of, of imagism as we create, which comes from poetry, but when we create pieces of theater. And, and so we thought like, let's lure people in with the beauty of what we do with this like, you know, lavish productions with projections and puppetry and, you know, architects working on set design and, and then let's bring down the hammer and, and, you know, like talk to them about something that's really important. Um, we, we felt like poetry and sort of imagism was like a side door into something we needed to be talking about. And I think now we've become more overt, actually, in the way that, that we speak about it. But yeah. that's, that's where we come from. And yeah. I mean, it's interesting. We've seen just, we haven't seen your work in, in example, uh, Annalisa, but we've seen humor as an entry point to bring people in and beauty as an entry point. And these are artistic strategies that have been used through time to bring audiences into um, challenging situations. And it's, I, I just wanna say that th this number of people in the house that came to see the show and the number of people here in the discussion, climate change is happening because it used to be like three people, <laughs> you know. It was really small crowd, so obviously it's getting bigger. And now, um, to my knowledge, there are two Broadway shows about climate change, SpongeBob the Musical, yes, and Hades, Hades Town. So um, we're, we're uh, it's, definitely, um, it's definitely becoming a, it's a burgeoning uh, field of practice. So um, we have some time for questions from the house. Panelists and performers, for the next panels, we'll have time for one question, and then we can engage question. with the panelists outside. So one question, if anyone has one. No pressure. <laughs> yes. Too scared? Oh, to be the one person. Uh, 
Um, let's just go to, and to uh, if we have a moment, let's just go to next steps. Because the, I, I know that a big part for all of us who are involved in this intersection is we're not done, there's more to do, urgency of now, what's next? So um, anybody in the house have something that they're doing next on the climate change story? Anybody want on from, from, from the group? So yes, I see you nodding, Cassidy. Do you, do you want to say something about a next? Or you guys next? What, what's up for you next, Robert? You're going to the Hemispheric Institute, right? Yeah, in, yeah. In so one Mexico. exciting development maybe worth mentioning that is totally open to anybody in the room is coming out of a convening that was created by HowlRound last summer um, in Boston. Um, there's this kind of nascent group forming called the Climate Commons for Theater and Performance. You can read more about it on HowlRound. Um, but that group of people is investigating different ways of coming together, different ways of researching and mobilizing different aesthetic and organizational strategies for kind of figuring out ways of talking about this. So one next step for that organization is a convening in Mexico City that's going to be happening in June, um, geared specifically towards like interrogating and hopefully um, articulating in, in a published uh, form like strategies specifically for using humor in conversations around climate crisis. So that's one next step that we're really excited about. And Annalisa, you were just mentioning the TCG conference. So there's a whole track, um, and it's a climate justice track. Yes. If you're coming to the TCG conference in Miami, and even if you're not, there will be ways to participate digitally. Um, but there is now a conference committee on climate for the first time ever, <laughs> um, which is great. Um, and there will be a whole series of events, um, including a lab on Wednesday, June 5th, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., um, and that is our Green New Theater Lab. So we'll be really visioning what that looks like at that lab. Um, and then there's a sort of like nuts and bolts lunch session for basically like how do you make your actual production process more sustainable, um, like using better <laughs> energy efficient technologies and um, thinking about sustainable costume design. Um, so really practical nuts and bolts. Um, and then there's gonna be a panel breakout, I think it's on Friday now, um, that will be a whole slew of folks that are working at different, um, m multiple different areas in the field. Some people will be, t um, for example, um, Gulf Shore Playhouse will be there talking about the flooding that they experienced and uh, planning for climate adaptation at their new building. Um, and I think some folks from OSF will be there to talk about the fires um, and how, like, you know, climate is actually affecting our um, budgets right now. Um, and then I'm leading a session on Friday morning at the conference on contemplative movement and climate justice. Um, and that is more of the um, sort of embodied practice that I will share at the TCG conference. That's great. And just to restate a little bit the climate justice point, which is obvious to everyone, I hope, that um, those of us who are able to turn on the air conditioning uh, when it gets a little hotter are in a very different situation than people around the world who um, cannot and who are already on the move because they can no longer farm or, or um, raise their cattle um, uh, as they have before. And so uh, islands disappearing. The, the climate, uh, as they say, as uh, climate um, impact is hitting harder on uh, those who didn't create the problem in the first place. So climate justice is a really important part of this conversation and we wanna keep it forefront and centered. Can I add one more thing ab ab yeah. on that note? Um, something that I noticed in the piece too was the, there's a moment of, of sort of saying that like we did this and I think there was a sort of like we all did this. Um, and that's actually not true. Um, th it's a very small percentage of the population that did this, um, and they are not being held accountable. And, and where I look to for hope in my work is actually to indigenous communities who have been living in the apocalypse since 1492 and before that. Um, but like they have survival strategies, and they've been surviving, and they will lead us into a future where we need to survive. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Jessica, did you want to add something? Oh, I, I, nothing as exciting as what you all are up to, but I'm, we're working on the um, the epilogue for the trilogy because.
because we can't stop and we won't. Um, <laughs> And then we're just working on reach for our for our touring model, so to get outside of New York, LA, DC, sorry, but places where people are, I mean, I, I think it is important to all be talking with each other, but, um, but I'm even more committed to bringing work and conversations and community engagement um, in new and inventive ways to places where people aren't used to having these conversations. Um, they may not believe in these conversations, and they definitely haven't seen Buto and maybe puppetry, and so we're like really working on opening up hearts and and then broadening a conversation where it's not happening already. Yeah, and I, um, I j just say stop when we have to stop because otherwise I'll keep going. But um, <laughs> I just want to say that um, those of us who have international networks, it's super important to keep those alive. Please, those of you who live in other countries um, uh, and uh, who know people who do, keep in touch. This is a global issue, and the global networks that we have are, are extremely valuable to us now so that we can keep that conversation global. Yes, Jessica. I just want to say that um, in case you people don't come up to you and ask that the Climate Change Theater Action goes from September 21st no, sorry, September 15th to December 21st this year, and the more people that can do it, the better, and um, we're doing it all over the world, and also Chantal is having a, an incubator, a climate change incubator, which is really fun. I've taught it a couple of years, and it's the um, scientists and theater artists together at, in New York, so just wanted to say that. And for those here at Georgetown, uh, Maya Roth, our incoming artistic director, and the season has, has programmed a, a number of climate performance projects, including a Lub Dub residency and more. So there'll be a lot that will be participating in that. Yes. So please join, the, join us if you wish. Um, and uh, thank you so much, and thanks to this wonderful.